Welcome back to the 2023 Haida Prevention Summit. I'm Laura Papar, Deputy Director for Treatment and Prevention at the Washington Baltimore Haida and Director of ADAPT, a Training and Technical Assistance Division for Substance Use Prevention Programming in Haida Communities. Many of you were to have joined us this morning for several just wonderful presentations offering global, national, and local perspectives on substance use prevention. But some of you are just joining us, especially from the West Coast. So I wanted to ground us again once more in the main message of our summits, that this main message has been threaded through all of the presentations, and you'll hear a strong focus on it in the subsequent presentations of today, this afternoon. The main message is that any prevention interventions, and you see from our title, we're addressing complex prevention issues, new substances, right? Any prevention interventions addressing current or new substances should be, number one, grounded in a comprehensive prevention strategy, and we've addressed all of that in our morning sessions, but also thoughtfully designed and evaluated using the best available evidence to protect from unintended harm. And so what we're going to be doing this afternoon is leaning into that idea of protecting youth from unintended harm through understanding the evidence that we already have, what's happened so far, lessons that we've learned. And again, I'm going to reiterate, this is the best we can do using the evidence we have right now. It's a snapshot of the way of thinking right now when integrating all that best available evidence. So I am pleased to present to you two ladies that we have enjoyed working with so much over the last few months. And here to introduce them is another one of our Haida directors. So I'm the executive director of the Central Florida Haida. I've been with Haida for approximately 16 months and will soon be engaging with our prevention partners to build our prevention strategy. Prevention is such an important piece to the strategy because we won't be able to solve the complex substance use issues of today with just one approach. There are fundamental differences in today's substances and the dangers associated with them. I wanna focus on building prevention strategy on what works, especially for our young people. And I'm thankful to the HIDA program for providing me a resource such as ADAPT to learn more about the science and support this effort. We plan on using Central Florida HIDA as a platform to engage partners across our region, working with youth and share important substance related information with them to prevent use before it starts. That's why I'm excited to review the slides and the material in this year's summit. Our overdose prevention strategies will partner with more upstream strategies so our HIDA can address the big picture for prevention. It's important for me to connect with our communities with the right prevention resources as the Central Florida HIDA disrupts and dismantles drug trafficking organizations throughout our region. Now that you know a little bit about us, I'm honored to announce our first set of panelists. These individuals re represent a wealth of knowledge and experience in substance use prevention. And they're here today to share with us the strategies on how to protect youth from unintended harm by using the best available evidence to inform a thoughtful approach to sharing drug information for prevention purposes. Our first panelist is Dr. Christine Steger. Dr. Steger is an assistant research professor in the Prevention Science Program in the Institute of Behavioral Science at the University of Colorado. Her research background and expertise are in prevention science, developmental psychopathology, ideology of youth problem behaviors, parent parenting and family processes, tobacco and cannabis use, and individual, family, school, and community-based interventions. Her primary research areas include social ecological risks and protective factors that may contribute to healthy youth development and development of externalization, internalizing and substance use problem behaviors. Translation of basic research into applied preventive intervention programs for youth, young adults, families, and communities. Rigorous methodological evaluation standards for designing and analyzing interventions through the blueprints for healthy youth development project and tobacco and cannabis research across the lifespan. Dr. Steger currently leads a large scale cluster randomized trial testing the effectiveness of school-based preventive intervention to prevent or reduce adolescent substance abuse. She is also leading a project 
focused on understanding disparities in nicotine and cannabis vaping among youth and other work. Our second panelist is Dr. Jessica Perkins. Dr. Perkins is an interdisciplinary social and behavioral scientist. Her research broadly assesses norm, social norms and social networks as drivers of substance abuse, balance HIV prevention and treatment and co-occurring behaviors and health outcomes. Specifically, she focuses on identifying misperceptions about health promoting norms with local networks as opportunities to implement norms based on strategies to encourage individual and collective change. Dr. Perkins' current research areas include leading the community engaged population based cohort study about misperceived social norms and their effects on health outcomes among adults in rural Uganda, assessing the role of social norms on health and development related behaviors among adolescents and college students in the US and addressing structural and social determinants of stigma and HIV prevention treatment outcomes among young adults in Tennessee throughout community engaged qualitative and quantitative projects. Her published body of work around social norms and social context spans substance use prevention and recovery, intimate partner violence, bullying, weapons and bystander attitudes, HIV testing, prevention and medication adherence food security, water security, and mental health. On behalf of the Central Florida Haida, please join me in welcoming our panelists. And we look forward to hearing your perspectives on how you would think through the process of sharing drug information with our youth. Okay, hello everyone, and thanks so much for the introduction, and thank you all for attending this session today. I'm really excited to be part of the Haida Prevention Summit this year, and I will jump right into my presentation. So today I'm going to talk about youth substance use prevention approaches, discuss a brief history of substance use prevention, Next, talk about the role of different approaches in prevention, some of the best practices of effective approaches. Next, where to find evidence-based prevention programs. And then finally, leave you all with some takeaways. So drug education, drug prevention, substance use prevention, these are all terms that are often broadly used. Sometimes they're interchangeably used as strategies for preventing youth substance use. I like the term substance use prevention because it's most inclusive of all substances. Now, uh, substance use prevention covers a range of outcomes, and these include increasing knowledge about substances, delaying onset of use, reducing use, reducing misuse, and minimizing harm. There are several youth substance use prevention approaches that can occur in many settings and they may encompass many activities. These approaches include information sharing, awareness campaigns, and these can be done through various communication methods. Also drug education curricula that focuses on learning outcomes, preventive interventions or prevention programs, typically evidence-based, and policies like raising tobacco taxes to prevent and reduce use. Now, these approaches can be standalone or they can be part of larger, more comprehensive and coordinated prevention efforts. Now, which of these approaches is effective? How do we know what works? To help answer these questions, I'd like to briefly review the history of substance use prevention approaches. These have evolved over many decades based on evidence. I think this is a really nice figure here that summarizes the main approaches from the 1950s to present. And this figure was developed originally by CADCA, which is Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. And it's cited in the Partnership to End Addiction document, Rethinking Substance Use Prevention. 
Starting in the 1950s, some of the earliest approaches use scare tactics, often through films or materials showing graphic images. They were sensationalizing risks or telling horror stories. A few examples of these, I'm sure many of you have heard of Scared Straight, boot camps, testimonials, kind of like one-off talks, lectures, or uh, assemblies. And what's the evidence of effectiveness? Well, scare tactics may actually cause more harm than good and do not change substance use behaviors. Why might this be? Well, youth tend to remember details delivered by someone with a personal account of drug use and recovery, but they may not make the connection between the story and their situation or behaviors. So next, during the later 1960s, approaches continued to use films and speakers, but they focus more on knowledge-based models, factual information about the harmful effects of substances. The evidence here by the late 1970s, information dissemination as an approach was determined to also be ineffective in changing substance use behavior, though there was a bit of evidence that it can increase substance use awareness. Why might this be? Well, presenting facts does not ensure understanding or relatability of the information or changes in behaviors. These approaches can also normalize substance use without providing true substance use norms. So next, in the 1970s, a second wave of efforts evolved that relied on educational curricula centered on value or decision-making models. And these models aim to reduce substance use through personal development and self-esteem self strategies. The evidence here, similar to scare tactics and information dissemination approaches, affective training or emotion training approaches were largely ineffective in changing youth substance use behavior. Why was this approach ineffective? Well, it's missing interactive social skill building, drug resistance skills, decision making, this interactive component that can really change behaviors. So a third wave of newer social competency programs were developed. And those programs incorporated these interactive social skills and social influences. And many of those social competency programs were found to be effective for reducing substance use. Now, finally, in this slide, I'm going to sum up the effective approaches. And these are research-based, evidence-based, and comprehensive prevention. Beginning in the late 1980s, there was this growing appreciation, growing acknowledgement that substance use prevention is complex and that we need to involve parents and communities in prevention efforts. And this trend continued over time with more of a focus on comprehensive programming that's grounded in science, that's theory-based, developmentally focused, and the importance of using data and evaluation to determine what works. And some of the most recent comprehensive prevention strategies are multi-tiered public health approaches. And these address risk and protective factors of substance use in multiple settings. So just to summarize here, what we've learned in prevention approaches from the 1950s to present the effective approaches are comprehensive, evidence-based prevention that addresses the root cause of problem behaviors. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few slides. The ineffective approaches are scare tactics, punitive and zero tolerance approaches, information dissemination only, affective or emotion training, and education only models. And it's important to note that many of these approaches are still popular despite being ineffective or only having weak evidence. 
Now, given the history of ineffective and effective prevention approaches, you might be asking, is there still a role of information sharing campaigns and drug education curricula in prevention? And the answer to this is yes, these approaches can still have value in comprehensive prevention efforts if they're done well. What we currently know is that information sharing materials and awareness media campaigns can have value as cost-effective methods that can effectively reach many youth. Some examples of some national campaigns include the FDA's The Real Cost campaign, it's tobacco focused. Also the National Youth Anti-Drug Campaign that ran from 1998 to 2004. And SAMHSA's Talk They Hear You campaign, which includes caregivers in this campaign as well as youth uh, to prevent underage drinking and other substance use. Now, what is the evidence for information sharing and in campaigns right now? Well, what studies show is that there's mixed evidence. Some show positive effects, some show no effects, and some even show harmful effects. Overall, some campaigns may be more effective in changing perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs than reducing actual substance use behavior. There is some evidence for uh, decreased risk for smoking initiation in the FDA's real cost campaign, but other campaigns may actually increase misperceptions of substance use, for example, in the National Youth Anti-Drug Campaign. But the revamped version of this campaign called Above the Influence, there has, it, some studies have shown that there have been some uh, positive effects for less marijuana use. Now, when we look at the overall evidence for information sharing and campaigns, we need to consider the limitations of current research, really so we can understand how findings uh, might actually vary depending on the type of campaign and the study design. My review of the evidence is that many studies are focused on short-term effects or they do not measure actual substance use behaviors beyond awareness, perceptions, and attitudes. What this tells us is there is a need to assess long-term effects whether some positive effects are sustained over time through high quality research evaluations. Just to note some current best practices in information sharing campaigns, the importance of including true positive norm messaging, making sure they're theory based and developmentally appropriate, and that they're part of this comprehensive prevention strategy. Now, there's a lot of interest in fentanyl specific information sharing and in campaigns. So I have a slide here that summarizes the evidence in this area. Many information sharing materials have been developed at local, state, and national levels. But currently, we know very little about the effectiveness of fentanyl information sharing and in campaigns on changing youth substance use awareness, attitudes, and behaviors. Like other substance use prevention campaigns, we need more research evaluations. What has been evaluated in this area has mostly focused on fentanyl awareness and overdose prevention for adults. So we definitely need to know more about how information sharing materials and campaigns work for youth. We can conclude that best practices for fentanyl specific prevention approaches are still currently unknown. I will say though that some states are making efforts to integrate effective science-based strategies into fentanyl information sharing materials and campaigns, and then also trying to ground those in larger comprehensive prevention strategies. The state of Colorado is an example of who is doing these efforts.
Okay, so I have mentioned comprehensive prevention a few times now, and I want to say a little bit more about what I mean by this. What we've learned from decades of research is that preventing substance use is multifaceted and it requires a comprehensive community based prevention strategy. These strategies are based on combined programs, practices, and policies that are grounded in scientific evidence. We use comprehensive strategies because the root causes of disordered and of positive development reach across all areas of influence, from individuals and peers, to family, to school, and community, and across all ages. Now, how have information sharing campaigns and drug prevention curricula been effectively used in comprehensive prevention? We know that anti-substance use campaigns and drug education curricula can be useful, but alone they're not sufficient to prevent substance use and addiction. They need to be part of this comprehensive strategy that addresses the root causes of substance use across multiple domains of developmental functioning. Many anti-substance use information sharing materials and campaigns have been implemented at the community level, national campaigns, and then also local and state campaigns at the community level, but they can also be implemented at a school level, family, and individual and peer level. And drug education curricula have typically been implemented in schools and have focused on how to teach new knowledge and critical thinking skills around substance use. These approaches can play a role in changing substance use attitudes or behaviors if they use effective content like social norms versus just presenting facts on substance use. And are coupled with preventive interventions that include skill building components. Now, as I've mentioned throughout the presentation, there are many approaches for the prevention of youth substance use. I've mostly focused on information sharing and campaigns and touched on drug education curricula, just given the interest in these topics. But I also want to highlight preventive interventions or evidence based prevention programs, which are structured programs. They're often manualized. Uh, they have a theory about how the intervention works. So these are super important in effective prevention approaches. And lastly, of course, um, policies are part of effective prevention approaches as well. Now, in this slide, I want to just summarize some of the best practices and core components in effective prevention approaches and you know a lot of people have written about this in review articles um, also in in book chapters they've been outlined but i'm just going to highlight some of the most important components here but if you're interested in more details and the references of who's written about this work and summarized it they're included as references and also as a table in a handout of my presentation today. So the first best practice or core component is the approach is informed by science and guided by theory, uh, typically having a logic model for how the intervention works. Next, it's developmentally appropriate in content, in the setting, of having an appropriate reading level. It's culturally and context sensitive. So for example, including cultural norms. The approach targets known risk and protective factors. A couple examples of risk factors include misperceptions of social norms, negative influences of, of social norms, and uh, just negative peer influences. And some protective factors include changing attitudes towards substances, 
and skill development in several areas, including social, emotional, cognitive, and substance use resistance skills. Another effective core component is interactive learning and skills practice for youth. So youth have the opportunity, for example, to role play um, or practice cooperative learning. Some additional best practices or core components. Adults and peers recognize and reinforce positive behavior. There's comprehensive interactive training for providers that increases provider competency and buy-in. When possible, uses peer leaders. Comprehensive and multimodal intervention components. An evidence-based program implementation. And I'd like to highlight evidence-based preventive interventions, which have the most comprehensive evidence as an effective approach for the prevention of youth substance use. Now, how do community members know what works and where can they find these evidence-based preventive interventions? Well, the great news is that resources already exist to select tested effective programs for preventing youth substance use. Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development is a great resource. It's a web-based registry of experimentally proven programs promoting the most rigorous scientific standard and review process for certification. A major goal of Blueprints is to pr provide communities with a trusted guide to interventions that work in a variety of areas for a variety of outcomes, including substance use prevention, prevention of other problem behaviors, and promotion of positive youth development. Blueprints is a user-friendly website where you can search for program outcomes, you can search for target populations, the program specifics, and according to specific risk and protective factors. I'd also like to note that Haida and ADAPT has uh, many other resources, links to other registries. Blueprints is not the only registry out there. It's comprehensive and it's a great source, but if you go to the Prevention Intervention Resource Center on the ADAPT website, you can find more um, information and other resources. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with some takeaways at this point. I hope you've learned that there are several youth substance use prevention approaches and they have a range of evidence. Many information sharing materials and campaigns, they still need to be evaluated for effectiveness. Information sharing, information sharing and campaigns and drug education curricula can still play a role in comprehensive prevention strategies. And how we've defined and, and described comprehensive prevention is based on key lessons learned from the prevention science field over the uh, past 40 years or so. And if you're interested in how can your community develop a comprehensive prevention strategy, there are many helpful existing resources. For example, uh, the ADAPTS developing a comprehensive community-based prevention strategy brief. I believe this is being released today, so hot off the press. And CDC and SAMHSA also have several um, great resources on their website. Another takeaway is to be strategic in prevention approaches. Have realistic expectations. Are you trying to change awareness, attitudes, behaviors, all of the above? and avoid unintended harm. And one way to do this is to not use ineffective strategies or approaches that we've covered today. And if you're implementing a universal strategy targeted to all youth, you need a thoughtful approach informed by evidence using things like that we know works like social norms communication, social emotional skills training, and other skills training. 
And lastly, uh, I just want to point out that the ADAPT sharing information prevention tool uh, complements my presentation and Jessica's presentation up next, and that will also be released. Thank you so much for your attention, and I am going to turn it over to Jessica at this point. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm excited that you're here for the second part of this um, hour long session that focuses on substance related information with youth age 11 to 18 and integrating the best available evidence. Specifically, this part today, um, I'm going to be introducing a tool uh, that is called, we've been calling the Social Norms Framework. And there is a new toolkit that's being released um, today. And I'm excited to present it to you all to think about how we can take what we've learned uh, regarding the foundational information that uh, Christine just shared regarding what works and what doesn't work and thinking through um, a particular approach called the social norms approach and how we can apply that to sharing substance use related information. All right, so for the next 20 to 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna be talking about um, social norms in general. That's gonna be about a five minute primer on uh, some term key terms that are helpful to know when thinking through what we are ultimately wanting to do when we design information campaigns, um, sharing substance use, we really wanna focus on going back what to Laura said at the introduction on preventing unintended harm. And unintended harm here refers to trying to reduce the chance of creating misperceptions or strengthening misperceived norms around substance use. So I'll be talking about the role of perception versus reality and then how those phenomena have informed the, the creation and application of the social norms approach, which is a preventive strategy focusing on sharing the positive norms that do exist among youth. And then how can we integrate that kind of information to sharing substance use related information with a few specific suggestions for how to do so around um, fentanyl specific information. Okay, so for part one today, and stick with me, this is a little bit of a social theory and a bit of conceptual foundation work. What I want to talk about is the fact that humans are all social animals. We, we have evolved to live in groups. We live with our peers and spend a lot of time in school, in our workplaces, in our communities. We, um, are, we want to be part of the group. We want to do what others are doing. And so a lot of our choices and our behavior and our decision making is informed by what we think others around us are doing. It affects what we're doing. And so that's an important sort of foundational aspect to this approach that we're going to talk about. Now, the key here is there's an important difference between what our, we consider to be perceived norms, and those are perceptions, individuals' perceptions about what their peers think and do. So what I, as an individual, think most of my peers support, what most of my peers think is right or wrong, and what most of my peers do. Those are my perceptions, they're perceived norms. And then it's really important to distinguish them from actual norms. And actual norms are what most peers actually think and do. So if I'm thinking about my peer group, whether that's my students at my school or friends in my community, you know, what are most people in my community supporting, thinking, and both of these types of social norms, that is perceived norms and actual norms, are, can be critical, important drivers of individual behavior and sort of overall social climate regarding different kinds of health-related behavior. Now, the critical key component here is the fact that decades and decades of research have shown that there's often a misalignment between perceived norms and actual norms. That is what people think they're most of their friends, most of their neighbors, most of their colleagues, most of the people in their religious or social organizations are doing, thinking and supporting. What I think most of them are doing, it doesn't actually match what is actually happening in terms of the majority behavior or the majority, the most common attitude in those groups. And that creates a situation, what we call, there's lots of misperceived norms. 
And so what we tend to find most often as research is that people on average incorrectly think that negative, unhealthy, and risk behavior and attitudes are common, that lots of their friends, lots of their peers, lots of neighbors engage in these risky, unhealthy behaviors like substance use. When in fact, when we look at data, and that can be observational, it can be archival, it can be objective measures and assessments, we know that the reality is that most friends, most teens, most youth, most adults are not engaging in risk behavior. Instead, the majority are engaging in healthy, positive, and they're holding positive attitudes about these pr pr productive behavior. And they often disapprove, most of them disapprove of risk behavior. And so there are lots of canonical examples of this, particularly in the substance use field. This has been studied for decades now at this point, and we know that both youth and adults misperceive extensively, particularly around substance use. You can name any substance use, and lots of youth, young adults, and adults think that everybody is doing it. You know, all my friends are going out getting drunk. Adults think there's lots of school parties every weekend, and all the students are attending them, and everybody's drinking, and you know, everybody's uh, vaping, everybody's using, using marijuana these days. And so there's lots of misperceived norms. And so what I want to highlight here is the fact that they matter. These misperceptions matter. So point number one, and this is, I promise, this is the end of sort of the foundational work here. Point number one, when people think substance use is the norm, they are more likely to make choices that align with that misperception. They're likely to use, they're more likely to accept others using, and they're more likely to go with others on to use too. So if I think that all of my peers are engaging in substance use, whether it's alcohol or vaping or taking pills, then I'm more likely to do it too. And I'm gonna sort of nudge others to do it as well. At the same time, if I think that people are more likely to use, but I don't, and instead I engage in other kinds of healthy behaviors, but I don't think that I'm the norm, then people are more likely to hide or diminish their own healthy behavior and protective choices and attitudes. And then that be, those healthy attitudes and behaviors, they become more and more invisible to others. And the third impact this can have is that people are also less likely to speak up when they do witness others engaging in substance use, or um, they're less likely to speak up when they see risky situations or even harmful negative outcomes from substance use, because they think those behaviors are normative and common. And yet the unfortunate thing is those misperceptions are incorrect. Now, this creates a harmful cycle, and I'm not sure what's going on with the slides here, but the harmful cycle is the fact that these healthy and protective behaviors are underestimated and made less visible while healthy behavior, unhealthy behaviors are overestimated and made more and more visible. And this leads to more and more unhealthy behavior. Now, one question that often gets asked is, well, where do all these misperceptions come from? There's a variety of forces out there in the world that creates these misperceptions. Just think about what we hear in the news, what we see in social media, what people tend to talk about, people tend to exaggerate. You know, lots of people hear headlines or hear conversations where it's like, oh, you know, there was a drunk driving accident. Oh, lots of my friends were out. Everybody was getting sick from drinking too much. Or so-and-so had a really bad um, time after they um, smoked some cannabis or took this pill. But what we don't hear in conversation and what we don't hear in the media are, are all the other people who are not engaging in substance use who disapprove of that substance use, who are, who, are not in, who are engaging in other alternative behaviors. That kind of healthy promoting behavior, those kinds of health promoting attitudes, they're not the subject of what gets talked about. Moreover, if we see something bad happen once, we often attribute it to happening very often. We attribute it to being the normative behavior. So there's lots of different sort of social media, conversational and psychological forces that lead to these misperceptions. So hopefully I've made the case that misperceptions are real, lots of people misperceive norms and that they matter because they affect behavior. Now this does present us with an opportunity, an opportunity to intervene. And so this next part, I'm gonna talk about the social norms approach. And this approach really focuses on the idea that we can engineer prevention and ultimately individual and social change 
by changing these misperceptions and strengthening accurate perceptions of healthy behaviors and attitudes that youth and adults do hold. So the social norms approach. This specifically aims to correct misperceived norms and strengthen and accurate perceptions to in turn prevent and reduce risk behavior. Because we know, again, from decades of research, that people want to do what others are doing. So if I think that most of my friends are engaging in healthy behaviors, I'm more likely to do so as well. I'm more likely to support others to, to do so, and I'm more likely to talk about that behavior. So we really want to focus on those positive, healthy norms. So we want to make them more audible, more salient, more visible to youth and other intended audiences, sort of the entire social system of people who are working with youth. And so the idea is we actually want to tell it like it really is. Let's look at the data. So yes, well, there are all some small portions of, of, of youth who are taking pills that are not prescribed, prescribed to them. And while there are, you know, some minority um, proportions of students and youth who are engaging in they are not the majority. And so the key here in this approach is to focus on flipping that statistic, flipping that conversation. And so we're going to talk about some of these positive norms and how we can integrate them into information sharing when we want to talk about new and emerging threats and drugs. Well, how can we also include information about these positive norms as a way to reduce the risk of accidentally creating perception that substance use is normative? So this is how it works. So the idea is, in the social norms approach, is that we have this intervention where it's an intensive exposure to actual positive norm messages about relevant groups. So these relevant groups represent youth in the school, youth in the neighborhood, in the communities. It could be at the state level. It could be specific social groups. So a certain youth of a certain age and certain um, racial or ethnic background, or an LGBTQ group. And the idea is to present these messages and also to the youth and to the associated adults. And the idea then, how it creates this change, is that it creates a sort of cognitive dissonance process where people start to wrestle with their ideas about what's really going on around them. And you engage in more conversation about it. And ultimately, it creates these less exaggerated misperceptions of peer norms, or it could completely correct their perception. And ultimately, it will have this predicted result that there'll be a greater of positive behaviors and attitudes and an increased support for others to engage in health promoting behavior and also to engage in bystander action. So when you're thinking about creating the social norms approach, the process in brief is one, you wanna identify a credible source of data in order to create from which you can create positive social norm messages. And you wanna have them, these messages be about the critical relevant groups. And then two, you got to train the team of people who you're working with to understand the social norms process, because a lot of people at first also have misperceived norms. Jess, three, yeah, Jess, Laura, I apologize for interrupting, but we're having a hard time hearing you sometimes, and we think maybe it's because when you move certain directions, you you actually are not heard at all. So do you oh. mind just trying to maybe lean forward a little? We're getting a lot sure. of comments around not being able to hear you. Let's I'm try so that. I'm so sorry, I didn't realize that. Oh, no, no, that's, that's better, keep going. <laughs> okay, I will try not to move. Okay, so the, sorry about that, folks. I'll try not to move. So the social norms approach process involves identifying a data source from which you can identify some positive norm messages. And often you'll have to think about flipping the statistics that you see. So instead of focusing on how many people are using a substance, well, think about the reverse. How many people are not using the substance? What kind of positive norm messages exist in these credible data sources? And when we say a credible data source, you, it's really important to think about how that data were collected and whether people are going to believe the data that you're going to present. And the more details you can provide about the data source, the better it will be in terms of people's um, belief in, this, in the messages that you provide. It's also really important, number two, to train the team that you're working with because all of us carry these misperceptions. And so the more and more that people understand the social norms approach and the sort of foundational phenomena behind it, the better they will be able to be to think about the message design and ultimately to engage community members in conversation as they try to wrestle with correcting their misperceptions. And then third, designing the, the messages, you really want to remember to focus on actual local norms about low risk or no risk behavior 
among youth, and also at the same time, presenting messages that include high engagement and protective behaviors and attitudes among youth. And it's really critical that as part of these messages to not include any of the ineffective or even harmful tactics that Christine presented in the earlier part of the session that scare tactics, for example, or other harmful messaging. And then finally, it's also really important to expose these messages, spread them widely across your intended target audience, spread them frequently. You want to think about the dosage and you want to spread them to both youth and adults because they're often engaging in conversation and it's helpful to wrestle with these ideas over and over. So the, so the wider and the more frequently that you can spread these messages, the more likely it will be that these perceptions will begin to change. I wanted to say a quick note on what I mean by positive norms. So positive norms can represent a wide variety of attitudes and behavior. It's not just about presenting norms on little to no substance use, but it can be presenting positive norms around the resistance skills and the protective behavioral strategies that youth and others are using to avoid substance use or situations with substance use. It can be about what are the other kinds of activities and behavior the activities they engage in for fun or how they cope with stress. And then also around bystander action, there's a lot of different kinds of actions that people can take to prevent others from using or to prevent harm that may come when people do use. And at the same time, there's a lot of different kinds of ad positive attitudes that these messages can um, touch upon. So in the data sets that you might find or the data that you might collect to help creating these positive norm messages, you, you can think creatively and widely about a variety of different positive norm messages. And then the last part of the social norms approach, it's, it's really important, we want to say, to evaluate or monitor your program because you want to request uh, feedback so that you can adjust your messages as you go along. You don't want to ever create messages that are sort of really um, turn people off. And then at the same time, you're going to want to address kickback because a lot of people won't believe these messages, won't believe the statistics at first that you're presenting. And so that's why you want to have a trained team to help engage people in the conversation around um, wrestling with these misperceptions. And then finally, you're going to want to compare it to some actual data over time so you can see that perceptions are changing as then and then ultimately behavior and attitudes. So based on all this, uh, this approach and this, um, this background, this team, we created a social norms framework that can, you can use in thinking about how to adapt the norms approach to presenting information about other substances. And it has three parts. One, the opening. And here you really want to hone in on the fact that most youth don't use substances. And most youth don't think it's okay for their peers and friends and other youth to use substances. And so that's, that's really a critical driver at the, at the opening of these kinds of campaigns. Because the point is, a lot of people, and youth in particular, think that all their peers are using, or that a lot of their peers are using, or that a lot of peers think that it's okay to use. But the reality is, you really want to open with that. And then there might be all kinds of other information that you want to include in the campaign, and that's fine. But you want to integrate with other kinds of positive norm messages. And I'll give some examples of positive norm messages that you might include around, and around other kinds of healthy behavioral alternatives. And then you conclude again with reiterating the fact that most youth don't use, most youth, most youth don't approve of use. And what do most use, youth do in terms of other kinds of ways to cope with stress or to have fun? And so here are some examples of what you could include in the opening. You want to include the fact that most youth in this school, for example, don't use the substance. And most youth don't think it's a good idea for other peers to use. And then a really critical component of any positive norms messaging is to not spread out throughout the, the communication, a data point that says where these data, if you don't include that, people are just gonna write it off and say, ah, oh, that's not true. But if you can remind them of the data source, perhaps remind them of the fact that they participated in the data collection, that they were one of the participants, that really drives home the fact that, huh, this data really does represent groups that I identify with. In the middle here, that's where you can sprinkle in a lot of other kinds of positive norm messages. And, and it also will depend on sort of the age of the students and the youth and their development level. So you can talk about how most youth in this school, for example, engage in bystander action and other kinds of specific behavioral strategies. 
and how, the other kinds of behaviors that youth do engage and how they view them favorably. And they wouldn't look down on anyone if they wanted to do these alternative behaviors instead. Other kinds of uh, positive norm messages can be targeted around what most parents and other adult caregivers of youth in the school disapprove of and approve of. For example, most adults have, have rules around youth substance use in their own homes, or that most parents of youth in this school talk with their children about how to protect themselves. You could also focus on positive trending um, behaviors. So for example, there might be some behaviors that might not be the actual norm yet. For example, perhaps around feeling comfortable administering Narcan or other kinds of protective um, actions, but it could be increasing. So for example, compared to last year, two times more youth in the school feel comfortable calling for help if they think someone has overdosed. So the closing, we wanna repeat some of those initial positive norm messages and sort of pair it together with a few hopeful summary statements and then remind the audience where the data come from. And sort of that really drives home, it reminds them of these positive norms and brings the focus off any sort of negative statistics that could um, create these misperceptions. And so the idea behind this social norms sandwich framework is to prevent the rise of misperceived norms. And this, by, by incorporating all these positive norm messages, it really gets at reducing that risk. So a few critical steps. One is finding a credible data source. And this new toolkit that's being provided has a number of resources for how to do so. And if you can't find one that sort of is relatable to the, your intended audience, some ways to think about collecting that data and some examples of places um, for help in thinking about how to do so. Second, you're really gonna need to spend some time interpreting what the true positive norms are once you do find a data set. And you may need to statistics because traditionally reports have often focused on the negative pattern of behaviors. And so this approach really focuses on the flip side of that. What are the positive pattern of behaviors? Number three, you wanna train your team in order to be able to talk about how to minimize skepticism because lots of us carry these misperceptions and it's not just youth. And then number four, you wanna to continue to monitor and evaluate to be able to inform adjustments and address skepticism. And if actual norms begin to change in that they become more and more positive, you want to incorporate that change as part of your positive norm messaging over time if this is going to be kind of a long-term, part of a long-term comprehensive approach. Now, one note about the role of youth in this process. Uh, it's the role of youth in this social norms approach process is really focused on, their role should really be focused on, on being the audience of these communications and they can help in providing some feedback about the messages, some feedback about the, the method by which the messages are given. But these youth are critically, most of the time, have a lot of misperceptions. And so it's important to not necessarily involve them in the so unless they're specifically trained on the social norms approach. And so their role, for the most part, in this kind of approach is on being the audience, the targeted audience, and on providing some feedback around the delivery and implementation of the messages. All right, so the last part of, of what I'm trying to present today focuses on sorry, sharing fentanyl information through the social norms framework. And remind, remember, this is the framework that I just presented with the closing in the middle and the end. And I'll present three different types of information that could be presented in, in an information sharing campaign about fentanyl from the positive norms, social norms framework. So one, you could include a focus on non-use norms because most youth are not using fentanyl unintentionally or intentionally. And most youth disapprove of use um, by, uh, among their peers. And so the idea is to reduce pills that are not prescribed by a healthcare provider. Often, the, albeit it's a small proportion, when people, when you do you know, take fentanyl, it's usually unintentionally, is it's usually through pills that are not prescribed to them. And so you wanna focus at the initial messages perhaps on the fact that most youth are not taking pills not prescribed to them. And this reduces misperceptions about peer pressure to use. So if people are starting to learn, oh, most of my peers are not taking these pills, I might be more comfortable, I might be more likely to say no thanks the next time in a situation where pills are presented. Number two, you could present positive norms about healthy actions that people, that most youth do engage in around the use of pills. So for example, most youth get pills from a pharmacy through a prescription. They're not getting it through the internet. Most youth are not getting it from a friend. They're most youth 
are getting pills from a pharmacy. And most youth take pills only in the way prescribed by a doctor. So even if they do have a prescription, they're not following um, you know, their own way of taking the pills. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing according to the prescription. A third strategy, a type of positive norm information you could provide is around bystander action. And so for example, most youth here are willing to get help or administer Narcan to a friend in case of an overdose. This might be an example of a trending norm. So it could be compared to last year, 50% more youth are willing to help out a friend who has an overdose. Another point would be most youth would help a friend get a fentanyl testing kit if they couldn't stop a friend from taking a substance. So I present these three strategies to sort of encourage people to begin to think creatively about the kinds of positive norms that you could build into data collection and then ultimately create some messaging around when you're thinking about designing an information sharing campaign around fentanyl. So a lot of this uh, is now presented in the upcoming toolkit that's going to be provided that, or that has been released to everyone. I encourage you to check it out. There's a lot more. And so there's resources to collect the data, resources to think about some general communication principles around how to make this kind of strategy most effective. And I think we're going to be hearing about an example of the social norms framework and how it's been applied in Colorado in our next session. Thanks, everyone. I'm happy to entertain questions either directly here or um, feel free to reach out to me. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Steger and Dr. Perkins. Thank you for introducing the background and the your own review of the literature and your own synthesis and your own minds of your areas of expertise. We do have that reflected in the tool and I want it to take just a minute because we are not able to upload documents into the chat box. We are able to upload a link. So I believe Dr. Steger mentioned our Prevention Intervention Resource Center. I'm gonna guide all of you there so that you can see the tool. And I believe we're gonna post it in the chat box right now. All right, so you should have that. If you click on that link, the first section you will see is one called Tools Released by ADAPT. At the top of that section, you will see two tools. On the left-hand side, you'll see the community, developing a comprehensive community prevention strategy brief. And then on the other side, you will see the sharing substance related information tool. That's the one you want <laughs> that we're referring to in this particular presentation. So go ahead and download that and make that available to yourself. And we have a few minutes, just a few for questions. So go ahead and populate any questions you might have. I've got a few here, Dr. Steger and Dr. Perkins, I'm gonna go ahead and ask them to you. Uh, the Real Cost Campaign. So the Real Cost Campaign by the FDA feels very scary, scare tactic-y, right? And I, I'm reading directly off of the comment here. So it, it seems to employ some of what we've suggested that you don't do, right? Is there anything pointing as to why this particular campaign had some level of success while not necessarily following prevention best practices or what we've learned so far? Any thoughts on that? Good, yes, good question from the audience there. You know, I'd really have to look into the specific content of the campaign, but I do think it it does have a lot of the effective components. And maybe some of the scare tactics were earlier on in the campaign, and they have evolved over time. I mean, a lot of these national campaigns have been in practice for many years, and they're constantly being updated. Um, like currently, the real cost, I mean, it started with uh, cigarette prevention, right? And over time, youth have been using fewer cigarettes, but they've been using way more e-cigarettes. So we're now vaping, right? And that that's another kind of component to this, this intervention or this, this uh, prevention campaign. And with that shift, to the current types of substances, vaping, that youth are using, I, I think they have incorporated probably fewer scare tactics 
and more healthy approaches and including social norms. So, I mean, it would be interesting actually to, to compare the cigarette version versus the e-cigarette version and see okay. the, what are the, the similarities and differences in content. Awesome, thank you for that. Dr. Perkins, I have a question specifically for you. This particular attendee presented information, social norms information in this way that most kids don't misuse substances and received pushback. They insisted that the data doesn't represent the world they see and experience every day in their schools. What should the audience do in situations like that? How should they so that's respond? A really, that's a really good question. So this comes up all the time. Pushback and skepticism should be considered a part of the process. It, 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 at a minimum, it indicates that people are hearing the messages and that they're kind of starting to walk and so that's why we say that social norms approach shouldn't just be a one-shot message that people see sort of one-off. It needs to be a consistent routine, um, a frequency of messages, and ultimately some, it, it helps to have some community conversations built around this. One, and so two, don't take it as, oh, this isn't working. Take it as, oh, this is a sign that people are hearing these messages and they're starting to experience some cognitive dissonance. Two, it's a, it's a really great lead into designing some small group discussions around it that can be a really effective way of thinking through how, well, what's what's going on? Let's let's talk about what's really going on, going on among our communities and among our friendship groups. And I should say that even in groups where substance use does occur or substance use is higher, those people are still overestimating the average among their groups. And so it's important to think about the fact that overestimation occurs in all different kinds of substance groups. In terms of trying to push back against that, I've suggested you know continuous continuous messaging with a variety of different messages, some community conversations, and then also again, as I said before, it does help to think about the credibility and the believability of your data source. So the more people can recognize that their the data represents themselves, typically over time they have a easier and easier time start starting to believe and wrestle with those messages. And it also helps too to not just target the youth, but also target sort of the, the older youth and adults that they work with so that it's a whole community change in the overarching perceptions and conversation. Okay. I know Patty's gonna kill me, but I'm gonna give you one more question because it's too good and we have to address it. So given the themes of the first half of the presentation about the limits of many communications campaigns this particular attendee and i think he he or she speaks for a lot of communities out there that we've worked with as well is it really feasible for community groups to develop and evaluate communications campaigns how would you address that is it really feasible at that local level? And they speak a little bit about, yes, it makes sense that states might do it and those with more resources, right? But is it really feasible at the community level? Go ahead. So, so yes, it is. Uh, one, reach out to ADAPT and HIDA for support and resources. They are <laughs> there to help you. Yes, to, yes to, uh, there's lots of, um, examples from all across the country of communities and schools, whether they are small schools or larger schools that have implemented these kinds of campaigns and these kinds of approaches. And typically, you don't have to think necessarily about starting with an entire comprehensive program. You can start off with something. And the idea behind, you can start off with one component. And the idea behind that is to pick a component and follow the evidence-based approaches and try to stay away from the ineffective or potentially harmful approaches. So it is okay to start small and have a long-term comprehensive programmatic goal. And there, there's, again, there's a lot of resources and um, that we could point to ex ex that talk about the success of some small programs out there across various communities and schools. Laura, I don't know how much time you want me to take up. No, that that you addressed it beautifully <laughs> and briefly. Thank you for that. Listen, Dr. Steger, Dr. Perkins, we asked you to do something very hard. And we were just talking about the work of prevention being hard in an earlier session. And we didn't give you much time either, did we? So we appreciate you being co-authors with us on the document that you all now have from the Prevention Intervention Resource Center. What Dr. Perkins was also referring to a little earlier was our substance use prevention communications toolkit that also can be found underneath that exact same heading 
this is more of that general starting point for that attendee that just asked the community level question. This is a great starting point for thinking through that. All right, at this time, we are going to close up this session and move on to a direct case study that actually has applied a lot of the principles and a lot of the strategies that Dr. Perkins and Dr. Steger just discussed. So we will be bringing that to life on the next session. I will see you there in just a few minutes.